This is going to be a scripture heavy episode, so I invite you to grab your favorite translation and follow along. Also, feel free to pause if you need to. I'm going to discuss in no great depth or specific sequence fallen angelic hosts, demons, Nephilim, and more. As far as this channel is concerned, these entities are likely an ancient evil masquerading as intergalactic nomads. From time immemorial, there has existed a belief that the inception of human life was aided by non-human intelligence. This notion goes back as far as ancient days when these beings were deified as gods. A great judgment befell these gods, the abominations created in their image, and those that worshipped them, however their influence still remained. This influence began to grow, intermittently manifesting throughout the ages. Fast forward to today, and we have paranormal activity, supernatural occurrences, demonic manifestation, and the UFO phenomena. I want to bring together a couple schools of thought here because I believe all these are interrelated. Let's address heavenly angelic hosts known plainly as angels. There seems to be a misconception about what they actually look like and what they can do. Angels aren't winged babies with shielded modesty, nor are they bare-breasted blondes with a single set of wings. In fact, Besides the description given in Zechariah 5.9, your typical angels are adult chimeric creatures with four, sometimes as many as six wings. Check it out, Isaiah 6.2. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. Here's another in Revelation 4, 6 through 8. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Ezekiel 1, 5 through 11 depicts a similar class of angel, cherubim, but with only four wings. And in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands, all four of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead, they did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a human being, and on the right side, each had the face of a lion, and on the left, the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. They had two wings spreading out upward, each wing touching that of the creature on either side, and each had two other wings covering its body. Ezekiel goes on to describe thrones known to some as Ophanim, celestial wheel-like creatures paired with the cherubim in Ezekiel 1, 16 through 18. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not change directions as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. It's no wonder when angels appear before man that people tend to fall to the ground in deep reverence. However, angels aren't limited to a single form. Some are shapeshifters. Take 2 Corinthians 11.14. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. We also see other examples of angelic shape-shifting abilities when angels took on the appearance of men in Genesis 18 when they ate with Abraham and Genesis 19 as they ventured into Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, the Genesis 18 passage hints at something interesting, specifically Genesis 18.8. Then he took curds and milk and the calf he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under a tree while they ate. If angels have the appropriate anatomy for digestion, it's not a stretch to imagine they might also be equipped with suitable anatomy for procreation. There are at least two separate Canaan-confirming accounts, Genesis 6-4 and Isaiah 14-21, of angels procreating, and both accounts occur with humans. These are the angels that kept not their first estate in Jude 1-6, otherwise known as fallen angels. The initial incursion illustrated in Genesis led to their diaspora, fomented by rebellion. Now, Genesis 6 accounts this unholy union as resulting in a race of giant hybrid offspring known as the Nephilim. The hybridization process was expanded by ensuing the mixture of animal genes resulting in the creation of chimera, hybrid creatures we've accepted as strictly mythical. This blatant disregard of Genesis 124 ultimately led to the corruption of flesh resulting in the Great Flood. 
Interesting side note, Joshua 10.13 and 2 Samuel 1.18, both Holy Spirit-inspired scripture, refers to the book of Joshua, an extra-biblical text which echoes this reality, stating, The sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air, and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other, in order therewith to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth, and it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth, all men and all animals. While the physicality of these creatures was lost, their spiritual essence persists. This is what's known remedially as a demon, the disembodied spirit of a Nephilim. In this disembodied state, it can be more difficult for spiritual wickedness to enact agenda since interactions are primarily facilitated through a veil instead of a physical vessel. But as we see in Mark 5 and Luke 9.39, if conditions are right, demons can possess a body or, more troubling, manifest as a deceased individual as in 1 Samuel 28. Though possession, manifestation, and communication are hindered by the veil with an appropriate conduit, medium, or channeler, these become easier to enable. Those who commit themselves to the practice of mediumship or channeling are purportedly in contact with benevolent extraterrestrials who wish to aid in the next step of human evolution. I've said it before, Darwin must have really hit the nail on the head if intergalactic visitors are endorsing his theory. Consider, just for a moment, aliens haven't come from thousands of light years away, but simply exist in a plane of reality outside of human perception. I'm convinced the developing technological platform is being utilized as a liaison of ascension for this ancient evil to re-establish a palpable authority in this realm. Fallen angels, demons, interdimensionals, or extraterrestrials, whatever name we choose to assign here, evidence suggests that their agenda isn't conducive to the human factor. I'm not insinuating every entity is demonic or malevolent. Some may very well be of God. I think 1 John 4 1 lends legitimacy to that. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. On many levels, whether you know it or not, there is a spiritual battle being waged. I could dive deeper, but I've taken enough of your time. For now, I'll leave you with Isaiah 54:17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Thanks for checking me out, and take care.